evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Wound Care Today Facebook Live. Um, thank you for joining us. We're well aware how incredibly busy you are, so it means a great deal. Um, tonight's event is called Healing Venus Legosas, A New Animated Way to Learn. And with me right now is our legendary speaker, Dr. Leanne Atkin. Good evening, Leanne. Good evening. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, everybody out there. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Had another busy day in Legolsa Clinic, and it's an absolute delight to be here today. I'm rather excited for this one. Good. Um, I'm well aware it's half seven, so delight. Maybe in inverted covers, so I'm sure you'd rather be with your feet up. Um, no, no, I love a bit of anatomy and physiology, especially when it comes in the form of cartoons. <laughs> Done. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, Leanne is doing this from home. So if we have any technology problems, please bear with us and we'll get them sorted as soon as possible. Um, the link for your certificate of attendance that counts towards revalidation will be made available towards the end of tonight's event. Um, the slides are available for download on our website, which is woundcare-today.com, and the event will be there too. So for those who have colleagues who aren't on Facebook, they can see the video on our website. Um, as Leanne will agree, the more involved you are with tonight's session, the better. Um, let us know where you're watching from. Let us know what you think. But also, if you have any questions, please let us know what they are, and we will endeavour to answer as many of those as possible towards the end of tonight's event. So here we are again. This is number eight. This is the eighth Microworld module. Um, we have almost 10,000 registered members all around the world from over 40 different countries, translated into seven different languages. So for all of you guys out there who've registered, thank you so much. Um, and for those who haven't, um, at the end of tonight's event, get involved, go to my microworld.online where we have modules, um, wound healing, wound exudate, infection control. There's stuff on the moist platform. We have DFU, we have incisional care, where we have pressure injuries. And tonight we have venous legosis. Um, so get involved, um, register now, um, and let us know what you think. Um, before we start, and um, we've got a little video coming your way in a second, but before we start, some massive thank you to the partners of Microworld who are Monica. Um, without your, I think, bravery, without your commitment to that innovation and to a new modern way of training and learning, Microworld wouldn't exist and this event wouldn't be happening. So just a massive thank you on behalf of me and the team. Um, before I hand over to Leanne, there's a little video that will give you a little flavour for what's on the website. And it looks like our team is off somewhere. Or are they? Not really. They're in the control tower. Here, the venous and lymphatic systems work together to return fluid and blood from the lower limbs back towards the heart, almost like a motorway system. And the system needs to be controlled in order to keep the body healthy. Or, like the controller is doing, trying to stop a traffic jam. The venous system is a low-pressure system made up of venules and veins. Venules are thin-walled vessels that can enlarge and collapse to store blood as it flows from the capillaries. And the veins return deoxygenated blood back to the heart. It's awesome. Um, so, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Over to you, Leanne. Hello, everybody. Um, so it's my delight to be here tonight. My name is Leanne Atkin. I'm a doctor, but doctor by PhD. I'm a very proud nurse of 30 years in practice. I'm a vascular nurse consultant at Mid York's NHS Teaching Trust and a research fellow at the University of Huddersfield. I have today been down and dirty in Leg Ulcer Clinic, and I think that that helps me to be able to present venous ulceration in a way, really, that starts to demystify it. Today's session is all, really, all going to be really based on that micro world. And what the micro world is helping you to do is to understand the anatomy and physiology. And I think this is really important if we're going to optimise care for our patients with venous leg ulceration. So like all good academics, I'm going to tell you your learning objectives before I even start this session. But we hope at the end of this session, you will improve your knowledge and your confidence and you will understand how Microworld offers you a very unique way to enhance your learning experience. It hopefully will start you to increase your understanding of the causes of venous leg ulceration 
and what the risk factors are of these. To understand more about the importance of holistic and complete assessment, we're going to update you on evidence-based practice for the management of patients with venous leg ulceration, talking about wound bed preparation and also about the importance of compression therapy. And we're going to really bring in the importance of why patients need to be at the heart of these decision making and why actually we need to be focusing on their education as a vital aspect of their treatment plan. And hopefully we'll give you a good taster that you will have a huge appetite to explore the micro world even further. There's lots of great classrooms within that that talk about everything from wound healing, wound bed preparation, exudate, bacterial control. There's a section on di diabetic foot ulceration. There's a whole suite of learning within the micro world. But today he's going to focus on that new classroom that's just been developed, developed and launched today on venous leg ulceration. So why the focus on venous leg ulceration? Well, it's because it's the most commonest cause of wound that's out there. If you look at this pie diagram, you can see that around a third of all the wounds out there are on the lower leg. 15% of those patients are suffering from venous leg ulceration. This equates to around 1.1 million people out there with leg ulceration and 730,000 of these have been diagnosed as having a venous leg ulceration. The one thing I'd like you to focus on though on this chart is those leg ulcers that are unspecified. 9% of all wounds out there are a leg ulcer without a specified diagnosis. That to me is really worrying because that's a leg ulcer without a diagnosis and therefore highly likely to be a patient without evidence-based practice. So what's the biggest impact in terms of or the biggest focus that needs to be when you're managing a patient with a lower leg wound? Well, the one thing that we need to focus on is actually getting the underlying pathophysiology. What is their diagnosis? Why has this ulcer occurred? Why has that skin broken down? There's many reasons why the skin breaks down in the lower leg, and these are all of them listed here. But the treatment for each of these is very different. If you've got a wound that's caused by arterial insufficiency, you'll be wanting to think of revascularization. And if anything, compression therapy would be harmful. If you've got a wound that's being caused by venous hypertension, compression therapy is key to the management of that patient. So we really need to focus on you understanding how you assess and accurately diagnose a patient and therefore set up that most optimum treatment care plan. And that's hopefully what this session is going to do, because we're going to increase your knowledge on the major thing in terms of that circulatory system. So when we talk about the circulatory system, you would often think about the arteries and the veins, but we also want you to be thinking in venous leg ulcer management about the lymphatic system, and that actually forms part of this circulatory system. The main function of the circulatory system is to the transport the oxygens and the nutrients to the cells themselves. But the circulation system has many other uh, functions too. Number one, it provides a protection of infection. Your lymph circulation system is a highway of white blood cells, if you like. It eliminates waste products, especially carbon dioxide and other waste material. It delivers nutrients, oxygen, but also glucose, vitamins, minerals from the gut to the actual cell where it's needed to be metabolized. And actually, the circulation system needs to be seen as your it's your, your boiler system, if you like, in terms of your heat regulation. What it does is it moves the heat that's generated from your liver throughout the whole of your body. So encouraging your body to keep lovely and warm like your radiators and your boilers do. I've mentioned the word boiler already because I'm a very simplistic girl when it comes to trying to understand things. And I like to think of your circulation system as this massive boiler the pump, the heart, and it starts off with all of this. To get an effective and good functioning circulatory system, we need an effective pump, if you like. So we need to ensure that that patient's got no significant underlying um, heart failure or any other form of irregularity that's going to impact that. 
My session today is going to focus on the circulatory system to the lower legs. But we've got to remember that the arteries and veins go all over our bodies. These are the major arteries and the veins within our lower leg. And I would really like you to think about which of these could you name? Which of these do you understand feeds which part of the muscle group? Because I think it's really important if you are working with patients with lower limb conditions, the more that you understand this, the more that you can decipher their care. So in other words, if a patient is seeing a vascular service and they talk about a patient having a femoral artery occlusion, I think it's always good for you to be able to picture it in your mind's eye of where that is within the body. When we talk about the circulatory system, though, many people think it's a closed system. And I've had many patients in my time ask me if I've got a blockage within my artery, am I going to get backflow throughout? And actually, it doesn't truly work like that. The arteries deliver the oxygenated blood from the heart down into the lower body. And then the veins pick up that deoxygenated blood, bring it back up to the heart to be oxygenated and to be pumped back through again. But it's not one closed system. The actual blood changes within this capillary bed, as you can see. And therefore, having a blockage within one system doesn't impact so much on the arteries and the veins, but it st certainly starts to impact on that beautiful thing called a capillary bed. And we'll be coming back to that in a little while. But to start this anatomy and physiology session for you, I want us to focus on what's the difference between the arteries and the veins. So the arteries, as I've said, carry the oxygenated blood down. And they're very thick walled vessels. They're made up of three layers. The intima, the middle layer, which is that single cell endothelium that you might be able to remember from your undergraduate training. That medial layer that's covered with connective tissue, smooth muscle tissue and elastic fibres. And then that outer layer, the adventitia layer, which is mostly covered by connective tissue. And the function of the arteries is to deliver that oxygenated blood from the heart down to those cells. The arteries themselves can contain and cope with high pressures. If you think about the pressure that's coming from your heart in terms of that systolic pressure, a normal systolic blood pressure is 120 to 140, but you can have blood pressures up to 200. And this artery is able to deal with that force inside that don't often dilate and turn aneurysmal. They often can cope with that high pressure. And they cope with that high pressure because of the amount of muscle layer within that medial lining. It's able to be able to, uh, to extend and contract slightly, but it's able to actually cope with that amount of pressure. That's very a different though than when we start to think about the veins. The veins are very similar to the arteries in terms it's made up of three layers, but actually it's got a very weak muscle layer in the middle. Your veins are your biggest reservoir for your blood. Around 70% of your blood at the moment in time is sat within your venous system. But what's different with the veins compared to the arteries is that they have these bi- cuspid valves. Bi just means two. So there's two valves that you don't get in the majority of your arteries that sit together and only allow the blood to move in one way direction. And that direction should be back up to your heart. But when you start to look at the difference between the veins and the arteries, there's one, two things that you tend to notice. The looming of them and the amount of endothelial cells is increased and that muscle layer is much more decreased. So as soon as you start to get high pressures within the veins, they cannot cope with this high pressure and therefore they start to dilate. As they start to dilate, the valves can no longer reach each other. So the valves start to become dysfunctional, allowing the blood to move downwards, not as it should just in an upward direction. And this starts to impact on this beautiful thing called the capillary bed. So you can see this is where the magic happens, if you like. You have the oxygenated blood coming in through that red arterial system. As it passes through 
that capillary in bed, the oxygen and the nutrients start to disperse into the surrounding tissues. And the, as it deoxygenated, it gets picked back up from the venous side of that capillary bed to be brought back up to the heart. And you can see the green vessels that's linked within that capillary bed, and that is your lymphatic circulatory system. And they are absolutely vital in picking up further waste products, further um, fluid such as plasma within that tissue space to be able to ensure that that tissue is functioning as it should. So I said those were that single endothelial lining. And I love this diagram because it starts you to understand what happens. So because you become a single endothelial lining, you're allowing the blood products and the nutrients to move from inside that vessel to that surrounding tissue through the joints within that endothelial cell. And you can see on this diagram underneath the microscope that change from that oxygenated blood to that deoxygenated blood as it moves through those many, many capillary beds. And what impacts that diffusion or um, a movement of that blood and that oxygen and that nutrients is many things. It's impacted by the actual blood flow and the pressure of the blood and the force of the blood. It's impacted by the hydrostatic force, so the pressure of the fluid, and also it's impacted by diffusion on osmosis. I'm referring to terms that you can remember from your undergraduate training here. So this is a rather complex diagram, but I do like it because it really starts you to think about what's happening on that capillary bed. You can see as the blood comes down, there's an outward hydrostatic force moving those blood products from in that capillary bed out into that surrounding tissue, forcing out the nutrients and the oxygen into that tissue space. At the same time, there's an inward osmotic force pushing those things back into that capillary bed. And that gives you a net value of around 11 millimetres of mercury in terms of the arterial force coming down. You've got a similar picture on the venous side of the capillary bed. You've got an outward hydrostatic force of 16, an inward osmotic force of 24, giving us a net pressure of 8. You don't need to know much about all of those numbers, but what I'd like you to understand is how detail that is and how when you start to change any of those pressures you start to change that um, very delicate function within that capillary bed so you can start to get abnormalities quite quickly in terms of once you start changing that hemostasis so let's just go back to that venous system the venous system is a clever system, I think. It's a two-way parallel drainage system. It combines deep veins, which is next door to the, the, the bone, if you like, and those veins are able to cope with higher pressure because they're supported by a muscle on either side of them, such as the gastrocnemius muscle. You have this perforator vein that connects the deep veins to the superficial tissue, Call the perforator vein because it perforates through that fascia within that muscle. And you've got that superficial vein, which is very close to the skin. And the blood should move through that superficial vein, through that perforating valve, up into that deep venous system. And it should only happen in a one-way direction. This diagram shows the differences on the left-hand side. This is your deep venous system. Mostly, we talk about this in terms of your popliteal vein and femoral vein. And on the left-hand side, you have your superficial system. And we often refer to that as the short saphenous or the great saphenous vein. But what is really interesting within the veins, I think, is that how does the blood move? So I often know in my mind's eye how the blood gets from my heart down to my toes in my arteries. It's this big thing called that heart that pumps the blood and it forces the blood all the way down to my toes. But if it's not a closed system, how does the blood get from your toes back up to your heart? Because it's working against gravity. And it happens by two different mechanisms. Firstly, by breathing. By moving of your diaphragm up, you get a little bit of a negative interthoracal pressure. So therefore, it sucks the blood a little bit on the way up. 
But actually, the major reason why the blood moves from your toes back up to your heart is your calf and foot muscle pump. You can see in this diagram that when the muscles are relaxed, they're relatively small. As soon as you exercise that muscle, even by tweaking your toes, the muscles start to um, enlarge. And it's like a pair of bellows, if you like, forcing that blood to move from the superficial system through the perforators to the deep system and back up to your heart. And so long as the valves are working correctly, it prevents that retrograde flow. I'm a vascular nurse consultant. I deal with lots of different types of venous disease. We have acute venous disease, such as deep vein thrombosis and superficial thrombophlebitis. We have chronic venous disease, which includes post-thrombotic system and venous uh, syndrome and venous obstruction. But today's session is going to talk about venous insufficiency and venous ulceration. When we talk, say venous insufficiency, we just mean the veins aren't working as they should. Also can be referred to as venous disease. They all mean the same thing, really. So I've already mentioned that within a healthy vein, the, the, the bicuspid valves should allow the blood to move in a one-way direction only. Because that vein can be under additional pressure, the vein starts to dilate, so the veins become inadequate. And what we tend to find is that we get a compromised venous system. So therefore, we get backflow within the superficial system. If the perforator valve goes, we can get pressures from the deep venous system being attributed to the superficial system. And if you've got deep vein from uh, incompetence, we have high pressure throughout the whole of that venous system. And when that starts to happen, the patients will start to exhibit symptoms. The first symptoms of venous hypertension, too high a pressure in that vein, is burning, itching, and a feeling of heaviness. Patients will often say that their legs feel achy and burning, especially around that gator region, especially towards the end of the day if they've been on the feet for a long period of time. But if that's not um, managed well, the patient can progress. And they can progress to having edema or swelling, skin changes such as hemosiderin staining and ultimate ulceration. An ulceration, if you like, is end stage venous hypertension. So what makes a patient more at risk of developing venous hypertension? Well, some of these risk factors are modifiable and some of them are not. You are unfortunate that you are more at risk of venous hypertension the older you get, and if you're female, especially if you're a female that's had a number of pregnancies. If you've got a family history of venous disease, unfortunately, varicose veins are mostly hereditary. So if your mum and dad's got them, they're coming your way. But there are certain things that increase your risk of developing venous hypertension. If you are overweight in terms of obese, it increases the venous pressure. If you're immobile, you will not be activating that calf muscle pump, so therefore having increased venous pressure. If you've got a history of deep vein thrombosis, you're more likely to have deep venous insufficiency and damage to those val valves. If you've got a history of IV drug use, you've tended to actually inject into every vein within that superficial system, therefore damaging the valves in multiple points. If you've got a history of varicose veins, by default, varicose veins is a result of venous hypertension. Or if you've got chronic edema, previous cellulitis or previous ulceration, this actually impacts on your lymphatic and your venous system, making you more at risk of further ulceration. Within venous hypertension, we actually scale this in terms of how bad the disease is. And this is called the CEAP scale. You can see C1, and many of you might be looking at that picture and thinking, gosh, I've got some of those. They are simply cosmetic. They won't be causing any symptoms. They're simply spider veins. They are not the, no concern whatsoever. The second is C2, and this is patients where you can have visible varicosities, but actually it's causing no symptoms. The patient is not getting evidence of any skin changes or any tired and achy legs. Whereas when we start to progress to significant symptoms in terms of C3, edema, C4, skin changes, C5, venous eczema, 
and C6 venous ulceration. And this is where we really need to start to focus. Now, when I first came into this game, I really couldn't understand venous leg ulceration. I couldn't understand. If you're telling me I've got too high a pressure within my veins and therefore too much blood, why does that cause a leg ulcer? Or surely extra blood is good, not bad. And I'd just like you to keep in your mind's eye this capillary bed. Imagine having too much pressure within that blue venous system. If you've got a higher pressure, it starts to impact on those hydrostatic and osmotic forces within that capillary bed. And what you tend to happen is that you start to push blood products within that capillary bed out into that surrounding tissue. Your three major blood products is plasma. So you'll often find with venous hypertension, you get edema. Your second blood product is red blood cells. As these break down, they leave behind their iron content, their hemoglobin, and you end up with hemosiderin staining. And finally, the last blood product is white blood cells. And this causes a chronic inflammatory reaction, activations of cytokines, which causes this chronic inflammation inside, which ultimately results in an ulcer. So when you're seeing these, you have to think about, it's not really about managing that wound itself. What we need to be managing is the high pressure within that capillary bed. Now, in that picture, that's a classic venous leg ulcer, that hemosiderin staining, mild edema, an area of ulceration on the gator. But all of these is venous hypertension too. So this is all related to that high pressure within the veins. And we need to be treating all of these the same as we do as classic venous ulceration. And when I say how we treat it, I'd like you to start looking at venous leg ulcers as a weed. I'd like you not to focus, if you like, on the wound itself, because actually I like to see that as a dandelion in the garden. You wouldn't just go and chop the dandelion's head off. We need to focus on the roots. The roots of the venous leg ulcer is within that venous system. That's where the high pressure is coming from. That's where the chronic inflammation is seeding from. And that's where we need to start to focus. Within wound care, we often talk about chronic inflammation on the wound itself. Within venous leg ulcer, the chronic inflammation goes much more deeper into that surrounding tissues. And the best way to treat this is strong compression by targeting that high pressure within those veins. But what is really important is actually the time. This is the most important aspect of managing a patient with any form of lower leg wound. There is an urgency in terms of their full holistic assessment and their accurate diagnosis and therefore to commence evidence-based treatment plans. From the point of ulceration or referral onto your uh, area, I give you 14 days to complete that full holistic assessment, including that ABPI if needed. And why do I set you such a high time limit? It's because we know the newer the ulcer, the more likely we are to get this to heal. You have a window of opportunity very much at the beginning few weeks of these ulcers to truly optimise them and to get them to heal within a matter of days slash weeks rather than waiting where healing will take weeks slash months. So when we talk about holistic assessment, what we mean is really thinking about that patient's risk factors. What are you seeing? What are the risk factors of developing arterial disease versus venous disease? And I like to think about this in three ways. I like to think about it from a patient perspective, from a limb perspective, and then finally from a wound perspective. So from a patient perspective, what we need to be assessing is actually thinking about their general medical history, their past medical history, what medication they're currently on. What's their family history? What's their mobility like? What's their lifestyle and their living situation? Are they sleeping in a bed or sleeping in a chair? We shouldn't forget the holistic approach in terms of their nutrition, their hydration, their pain, and the psychosocial impact of living with a non-healing wound. 
When we've looked at the patient factors, we can then turn to the limb. We can think about what's the shape of that leg? Where, if there is some edema, where is that edema? What's the tissue condition? Is that edema soft or is it quite firm? Is the skin hydrated or is it quite dehydrated? Have we got areas of fibrosis within that or areas of eczema? What's the colour? Have we got that hemosiderin staining or have we got that what often mimics cellulitis, that red inflammatory band around that lower gator region? Have we got some erythema, which indicates venous hypertension? What's the colour of that leg? Is it nice and warm or is it actually quite cold? And what's the condition of the nails? Because the nails can tell you a lot in terms of what is their circulation in terms of the arterial supply doing. Once we've assessed the limb, it's then and only then we should be thinking about considering looking at the wound. Where is the wound? It's more likely that a venous leg ulcer occurs on the lower gator region. However, the can occur on the foot. What's the tissue type in terms of is it necrotic or is it sloughy? Necrotic wounds are more likely to be arterial in nature and sloughy wounds are more likely to be venous in nature. That's not always so black and white, but more likely. We need to be thinking about what's the size of the wounds, what's the depth of the wound. What's the wound edge doing? Have we got nice healthy beaches where epithelialization will be occurring or have we got steep cliff edges where we need to think about refashioning the edge of that wound? What's the exudate level like? And I love the structured forms of wound assessment that we've got available to us. Time, thinking about the tissue, infection, moisture and wound edge or moist. And there is a micro world session all about moist. And that's the acronym that looks at moisture, oxygen, infection, support and tissues. But all of these assessments can actually provide you a structured form to make sure you are considering all aspects of appropriate wound management. So once we've undertaken that holistic assessment, we then need to think about if we're managing, if we've diagnosed a venous leg ulcer, how do we actually manage that? I like to think about venous leg ulcer management as a multifaceted approach, if you like. Of course, we need to consider that psychological support, the management of their pain, thinking about the nutrition, thinking about the movement and exercise, and thinking about us and how do we prepare that wound bed for healing and how do we care for that surrounding skin. But there's two major cornerstones, if you like, of venous leg ulcer management. That is strong compression therapy, but also venous ablation. So when we talk about compression therapy, it is the one thing within nursing that is highly evidence-based. There's randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, meta-analysis to tell us that compression therapy works. There is high level of evidence. And actually, I'd like you to think about compression therapy as a potent anti-inflammatory device, because actually, we can start to break down that cycle of edema and inflammation by actually containing and reducing that venous pressure. You can see the beauty of compression therapy. This is a patient who's had compression therapy on for only two weeks, and you've managed to be able to turn that wound in from a looking like a chronic wound into a perfectly healed leg with only two weeks. And the reason why that took such a short period of time is that that wound had only been there for a matter of days. We need to be treating these patients earlier on in their journey. The good thing about compression therapy in these days, though, that there is a huge range of treatment options available to you. Compression bandaging, compression wrap systems, compression hosiery kits, and there's a huge array of aids to help the application for this. And compression therapy in itself is known to improve patient symptoms and to also improve the quality of life. So, as mentioned, we have had this evolution, if you like, of compression therapy. And I really think we are in a good place at this moment in time in terms of what options we have for our patients. You may think that multi-layer bandaging is what we could class as gold standard, but actually you can also class compression hosiery kits as gold standard too. And I'm able to say this because of the Venus 4 study. 
The Venus Four study was published um, now back in 2014. It was a large randomised control study performed within the UK, looking at over 450 patients. It simply randomised the patients to receiving compression multilayer bandaging or compression hosiery kits. And they found that actually that they heal in very similar timeframes, but there is an advantage in terms of reducing cost. And the conclusion of that study was actually if we could increase the use of the two of their hosiery kits within the UK, there is a substantial saving available for the NHS and improved quality of life for patients with venous leg ulceration. And therefore, it's no real surprise that actually compression hosiery kits are promoted as first line within the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, leg ulceration clinical recommendations. However, not every patient's leg or wound is suitable for a compression hosiery kit. There are certain times when that patient does require strong multi-component bandaging. And those patients should have bandaging if they have substantial amount of chronic edema that needs to be reduced, that their leg is of abnormal shape where we need additional padding or additional strapping. If we've got copious amounts of exudates where that cannot be controlled within the dressing, we need additional um, um, absorbency from that compression bandage. Or if the patient has extremely fragile skin where you're worried about the trauma of applying and removing that compression hosiery, then those patients should be treated first line with multi-component compression bandaging. But what is clear is that we need these patients in strong compression. This graduated elastic pressure of at least 40 milligrams of mercury pressure. Please don't be using light compression or reduced compression on patients with venous leg ulceration. It's simply sub-therapeutic. It's like tickling the leg, if you like. There is no, we need to be thinking about getting the amount of pressure needed to start to change that physiological effect on that capillary bed. So I'd like you just to think about, do you know what pressure the compression therapy you're using is providing? And what I would say is I would encourage you to use some of the proven systems that's on the market because actually they have been tested to provide a certain amount of pressure. But what is absolutely key to this is application. So we need to make sure that whatever compression therapy you are using, you are good at applying. You don't need to learn how to apply every compression bandage that's out there. Learn one or two of them. Be good, good at the application of those one and two um, options you've got just to make sure that you are getting that sustained graduated compression that's needed. And see, so these are some of the options that we've got available to us. We have compression hosiery kits. We have compression wraps. We have multi-layer bandaging. We have additional foot pieces to go with leg pieces and even beautiful toe caps if your patient's got significant amount of edema on their toes. But what we really need you to be focusing on is consider that this is a weed. So if you can see this picture on that left hand side, you can see a venous leg ulcer and you can see that edema, hemosiderin staining and that chronic inflammation. And you can sort of see what's feeding it. You can see that varicosity that's coming up into their leg. And that's actually the vein that's being incompetent with the valves, fade, fade, with the valves um, failing. And that's what's feeding this leg ulcer. In today's world, we have multiple options for available of how we can treat that. We should always treat these patients with strong compression therapy. But in a way, that's a palliative support. You're just supporting the veins from the outside. In today, within many vascular centres across the UK and across the world, we have minimally invasive treatment options to be able to actually rectify that varicose vein that you can see. That requires a simple ultrasound scan performed in a clinic setting. If you can see within this ultrasound, you can see the deep vein, which is the larger vessel. You can see the superficial vein, on the top of that screen, and these actually join together in your groin. Within this patient, the valve on that superficial femoral junction is failing. So the back pressure from that deep vein is being pushed down that superficial system, and that's what's causing the patient's symptoms. What we're able to do is to simply insert a catheter within the vein. We actually 
close the vein by using heat or chemicals, and you can see the results that you can get instantly from this type of procedure. It's a minimally invasive walk-in, proce walk walk-out procedure done under local anaesthetic, and people have been known to return to work the same afternoon, if not the day after. So many of your patients may well be suitable for this intervention. And the reason why I'm talking about it today is that actually there's been another randomised control study called the EVRA study. I'm thinking about actually using compression therapy or compression therapy plus venous ablation. And if we're able to operate on these veins as well as apply compression therapy, we can heal the patients 30 days quicker and actually we reduce their risk of recurrence significantly. And I'd simply ask you, if you had a venous leg ulcer, would you want to have compression therapy for the rest of your life? Or actually, would you like a minimally invasive procedure that cures you of your venous hypertension and therefore may reduce the need for you to wear lifelong compression? I certainly think we should be offering this to more patients. So I'd just like to leave this with, how are you involving your patients at this moment in time? I think that we really need to be thinking about embracing patient engagement, activating them to look after their own legs as much as possible, implementing self-care solutions wherever we can, and really thinking about empowering those patients to make the right decision. We talk often about putting patients at the heart of everything we do, and sometimes I feel that we're just saying this as tokenism. I urge you to have a look at the NHS England website, which talks about patient activation. There's a whole host of information there about how we should be speaking to our patients, engaging with our patients and activating our patients so they're able to take care of their overall health, not simply that leg ulcer. So I hope today's session you found interesting. What I would say is, please try to increase your knowledge about anatomy and physiology. I really start to think if you can close your eyes and see what's going on, it helps you to understand the pathophysiology, but it also links to that, how we should be treating these patients. The first step to good care for a patient with venous leg ulceration is timely diagnosis. I'm setting you a challenge. Full holistic assessment with diagnosis within 14 days of wounding, or referral onto your service. Know your signs of venous hypertension. Know what you're trying to look for. Use evidence-based treatments wherever possible. Think about that good, strong, consistent compression that is a cornerstone of healing these patients with venous leg ulceration. But actually think about how you as a practitioner can consider venous intervention. What's your links in to your local vascular services? And please, please remember, escalate where needed. Escalation is not a marker of failure of care. Escalation is a marker of good care. You're saying that you need help with this patient and you understand we need to get this patient to heal as soon as possible. So hopefully at this end of this, I urge you now to actually go and have a look in the micro world because Hopefully, once we start to repeat and recap this information, it starts to make more sense to you. I love the micro world because it uses simple cartoons for you to understand the anatomy and physiology in a really um, easy way. It helps you because it does a little bit of pre and post testing in terms of making you think about what's your knowledge base and where are your gaps. And it helps you to monitor your progress through the dashboard and there's also a few quite fun games built into this to break up that sometimes hard to go he, uh, um, um, learning. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed the session. As I said, please, please sign up and start to explore the micro world. There's many other lessons and classrooms within that, which I find really informative. So hopefully I'll hand over to Ed and hopefully there may be some questions lurking in the background. Thank you all. So hopefully you have. Um, I'm here and we have got questions. Um, Leanne, that was awesome. Um, we've had hundreds and hundreds of viewers from all around the world, all across the UK, but also Australia, New Zealand, Belize, Canada, Australia, um, UAE, 
um, Malta. Um, so guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, a lot of people are asking around the website, so it's mymicworld.online. Alec, who's on comments, will post that. But if it's okay with you, Leanne, I'm going to crack on with some questions, so I've got quite a few to go through. Um, so question number one is, how do I talk to my patients about venous ablation? I think that's a really good question, and I might talk about it relatively easy because I'm a vascular nurse consultant and I sit in this world if you were a district nurse, how do you start this conversation with your patient when you know very little about it? The one thing I'd urge you all to, no matter where you are in the entire world, there's been a newly published NHS decision-making support tool. Mo hopefully will have this to the chat. This really starts to explain in patient language what's the reason for venous ablation, what does it involve, and what's the risks and benefits. So it really helps that patient to make that informed decision and to be involved in their care. So I think that's the first thing that you should do. Have a read of that. Even as a clinician, you'll find it rather insightful. And that's your first conversation to have. The second thing you need to do is to find out locally what's your routes to referring to vascular. Within vascular services within mid Yorks, we'll accept a referral from anybody. So it doesn't have to be a doctor. It can simply be a nurse into vascular. If you say the words, the patient has a venous leg ulcer, consideration for venous ablation, they jump straight to the top of our queue, they'll be seen within two weeks. And I know many other vascular services treat venous leg ulceration just like that. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, question two, um, my patient won't wear compression. Any oh. oh, it's my favourite one. Yes. Um, I think there's a few things with this, Ed. Um, number one, we are quick to blame the patients. They're non-compliant, they're non-adherent, they won't do as they're told. I think there's a few things. If you told me, um, uh, Leanne, there's this tight bandage I want you to wear, my answer would be no. And I think that we've got to realise that we need to be car salespeople in this game. If I said to you, wear this bandage, you'd say no. But if I said to you, the reason why your leg looks like it is is because of that high pressure within that vein. I know that that looks really sore and I can imagine that's terribly painful. But it's because of that high pressure within that vein and that inflammation below that tissue. And the only way that we're going to be able to help you with that is to put on this supportive compression system. That compression system will start to reverse that venous hypertension, reduce that inflammation, and it will get this wound to heal. Are you prepared to give that a go? And I think many of the patients that we say are non-compliant, we haven't explained it properly, or even worse, We've put a compression system on that didn't actually work and therefore we have disenfranchised that patient with that compression. Remember to be therapeutic for a venous leg ulcer patient, compression needs to be at least 40 milligrams of mercury. So again, if I had a venous leg ulcer and you were putting on a reduced compression bandage that's providing 20 to 30 milligrams of mercury, it's not making me wound any better. I'd probably say to you after two months, take it off. It's not doing anything. So I think it's about understanding the tools that you're using, understanding the need for at least 40 milligrams of mercury pressure and really informing your patients of the actual need for this in terms of their underlying pathophysiology. And I think if we would all got that right, I think the number of non-compliant patients would reduce down to a tiny, tiny few. Whenever I hear you talk about that communication piece, I smile. It's so, it's so important that that, ability to persuade but also remind them of the joy of healing you know too much chat around management but actually and burden of wounds but actually the joy of healing you know the ability yeah. to go to golf again to go to your friend's wedding to go to the cinema and those outcomes and i love it when you talk about it leanne because that communication piece is so so key well it comes back to the conversations that me and you've had before you know i, I could sort of um uh, really challenge a nurse who says to me they're good at wound management I don't think we should be good at wound management. I think we should be good at wound healing. Wound yeah. management says we'll put a dressing on forever and a day and we'll titivate and we'll be okay. Forget that. The focus should be on wound healing. Every wound should heal within 12 weeks. If not, why not? You need a deep dive investigation of why that isn't healing. It needs to be escalated through. What we shouldn't be doing is just the same old thing and expecting a different outcome to happen. If I could go back 12 years, I'd change the title of our business from wound care today to wound healing today. 
<laughs> Indeed. Yeah, yeah. That would be a good re rebanding. Well, that's another conversation. So question <laughs> three, um, will my patient need to be in compression for life after their VLU has healed? So there's two different um, options for this, really. Um, if you've had a venous leg ulcer and you're not exploring venous ablation, the recommendation is that patient is on lifelong compression to be able to control their venous hypertension. And the recommendation is they're in as strong as compression as they could tolerate. So some patients should be carried on for 40 milligrams of mercury pressure forever, if not a class three, if not a class two, depending on which level of compression we can get them in and apply and remove on a long-term basis. If, though, that patient's undergone venous ablation and that has been successful and we've cured them of their venous hypertension, those patients may not need to wear lifelong compression. And that's why I think every patient should be explored for venous ablation. You've got to remember, though, that not every venous leg ulcer will be suitable for venous ablation. So a venous leg ulcer, because of incompetent valves, we can do something about but a venous leg ulcer that's simply there because of failure of calf muscle pump, there's no operation that we can do within vascular. Those patients will need to be on compression on a long-term basis. But the only way to determine that is venous duplex scanning. And that's why every patient with a venous leg ulcer should be referred to a vascular centre. Brilliant. So we've got three more questions in about five more minutes because I'm well aware that people want to get on with their evening. So question four from Cathy. What does the C stand for in the venous hypertension chart? Um, um, oh, um, condition is what it start, stands for. Um, it's um, it's American, so it's condition. Then it's called E for etiology, down, um, and and then it's anatomy, and then it's pathophysiology, and that's what it stands for. Um, again, if you keep on this, I will send the link to Mal that you can read more about that CEA piece uh, chat um, and you'll find it standardised across the world is that. We can put a little link on without a problem. Brilliant, thank you. Um, question five uh, from Rajulu. Does poor circulation cause ulcers, non-healing and delayed healing? Absolutely. When you say poor circulation, I'd challenge you. I would challenge you to say which part of your circulation. So... Circulatory system's got three components, venous, lymph, and arterial. I think what you're referring to is a problem in terms of arterial supply. Absolutely. Peripheral arterial disease will impact on wound healing. That's a very different subset of patients. And maybe for classroom number eight or nine, that's what we should be doing, the management of arterial disease. So those patients should be retreated by revascularization rather than compression therapy, because obviously... We need good tissue perfusion to be able to get these wounds to heal. Brilliant, thank you. So last question um, from Asmaret. What is the difference between a diabetic foot ulcer and a leg ulcer? Oh, a completely different um, pathophysiologies. So what we're talking about of leg ulcers, leg ulcers occur because of venous hypertension, chronic edema or arterial insufficiency. Diabetic foot ulcers tend to occur on the foot they have three different mechanisms, neuropathy, infection or peripheral arterial disease, and you can get a mixture of all of those three things. In micro world, there's already a session on diabetic foot ulceration. I urge you to go and have a watch of that one after you've watched the venous leg ulcer one. That'll bring you up to speed in terms of the pathophysiology of diabetic foot management. It's a very different subset compared to what we're talking about today. Um, you would be a brilliant salesperson, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Um, so that finishes tonight's session, guys. So the link for your certificate of attendance should be available now um, in the comment section or in the pinned area. So you can download that for your revalidation. Um, as Leanne said, please go to mymicroworld.online, get involved, do the modules, let us know what you think. Um, your feedback's really important. We've got more modules coming later this year on burns and also debridement. So we'll keep you in touch with regards to when those happen. Um, it's a massive thank you, Leanne, from me. I know how no, much it's my pleasure as always. I love doing these. I, 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 I love to teach and I love having such an engaged audience. So thank you so much for your questions. It really makes a difference to me knowing that there's actually people out there that's engaging. So thank you for giving up your time this evening. If you get a chance, have a look. There'll be so many lovely comments made, Leanne. Uh, I know you'll be proud of that. So thank you for your engagement, guys. Um, a massive thank you to um, the team at Wound Care People, but also get animated. 
I mean, the modules, when you see them, are incredible. So just an incredible thank you for me for all the work that's gone into that. Um, again, a big thank you to Manlika. Um, there's so much support goes on behind the scenes. I know how hard you've been pushing this around the world, and we've seen that in the audience we've had tonight. Um, so listen, the last thank you always is to you. Um, you guys are incredible. You've given up your time again tonight. Um, you humble and inspire, and we'll continue to do everything we can to support you. Um, so guys, have a lovely evening. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you very soon. Thank you so much. Goodbye.